Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Peter Singer, in his Biological Basis of Ethics, is going to discuss reciprocal altruism. And altruism is a general designator for behavior or motivations that make the other, the alter, central in our decision making, where we prioritize the good, the benefits, the interest of the other, sometimes to the detriment of our own, but not necessarily so. And Singer is interested here in not altruism just as such, but in reciprocal altruism. Altruism where people are engaged in reciprocity as a norm. And he points out, bringing up a few different people, uh, different scholars, that, there, that this is a very universal tendency. We find this across cultures and throughout time. So he, he quotes uh, sociologist Alvin Guldner, contrary to some cultural relativists, it can be hypothesized that a norm of reciprocity is universal. And that's a pretty strong statement, but he's probably right about that. doesn't mean that everybody follows it, as we're going to see in just a moment, but there's a norm in place within practically every culture. So... Singer says it's surprising how many features of human ethics could have grown out of simple reciprocal practices like, for example, mutual removal of parasites from awkward places one cannot oneself reach. Suppose I want to have, it was kind of a gross example that may turn some of you off, but think about it in terms of ancient human beings. Suppose I want to have the lice in my hair picked out. To obtain this, I'm willing to pick out someone else's lice. But already with that, I have to be discriminating. I have to discriminate who is going to be a good lice picker, a reliable lice picker, and who is going to take my lice picking and not reward me in the process. He says, if I help everybody indiscriminately, I will find myself grooming others who don't groom me back. So to avoid this waste of time and effort, I distinguish between those who repay me for my assistance and those who do not. In other words, he says, I separate those who deal fear fairly with me from those who cheat. Those who don't repay me, I shall mark out to avoid. Indeed, I may go further still, reacting with anger and hostility. So if we generalize from this relationship and we talk about anything else, you know, um, go, get into advanced social life. You invite people to your party, but they don't invite you to yours, to theirs. Well, something's wrong there, right? What's going on? There's a, a, an expectation that there'll be a sort of repayment of benefits. So he says, um, let's take individually these, these, these outgrowths of reciprocal altruism the most crucial distinction between, is between those who it's worth my while to assist and those who's not. And we have to think about those who are going to actually benefit us. So he says that um, the practice of reciprocal altruism can tolerate rough justice at this point, but we would expect that as human powers of reasoning and communication increased, Decisions as to what it is or is not an equitable exchange would become more precise. As we develop our cognitive and linguistic abilities and our culture, we're able to make finer and finer distinctions about what we ought to get or what we ought to give or who we ought not to give anything to. And he talks about the development of positive feelings towards those who benefit us. One of the most common of these positive feelings is what we call 
gratitude. Right? So he, he quotes uh, you know, a few people here, uh, Polybius, right, who says, when a man who has been helped when in danger by another does not show gratitude to his preserver, but goes to the length of attempting to do him injury, it's clear those who become aware of it will naturally be displeased and offended by such conduct, sharing the resentment of their injured neighbor. He goes on and on and on. So he says that, to, to say the duty to repay benefits is the beginning and end of justice is an overstatement, but that it is the beginning is plausible. Right and wrong, the notion of what you ought to do. Those who actually benefit you, just think about parents, you know, uh, giving you life, nourishing you, raising you, you should be grateful to them. You should be benevolent towards them. There should be reciprocity. Um, you're you know, brother or sister who hides your stuff and picks on you and makes fun of you with their friends. Uh, maybe, you know, kin altruism would say you still have to be good to them because they're your, your kin. But reciprocal altruism could say, screw you. I'm not going to give you anything. You never benefit me. You actually treat me in, in bad ways. So we have positive feelings towards those who would benefit us. And then we have uh, negative feelings towards those who don't reciprocate. And these negative feelings can take the form of indignation and they can even go to revenge. And revenge can be for not doing something. For example, people get really angry when you don't learn their names. And this is a big problem for me because I have a hard time remembering names, including those even of my students. The older I get, the, the more trouble I have with that. Uh, and monomic devices don't seem to help. Um, so I just have to live with it, right? But I should know that people may get indignant if I, if I get their name wrong. And we can go further with revenge. Revenge can also be for something somebody else did where they positively harmed me. They injured me. They insulted me. They humiliated me. They hindered me. They did something that made me angry. And so we have these positive and negative feelings. And he says that, you know, from our positive feelings for those who help us spring the bonds of friendship and the loyalty we feel to friends. From our negative feelings for those who do not reciprocate, we get moral indignation and the desire to punish. If reciprocal altruism played a significant role in human evolution, an aversion to being cheated would be a distinct advantage. So he's saying that, you know, we can hypothesize that this became the way that we are, this panoply of feelings that we have as a result of people doing or not doing things because of evolution. So he says um, humans have this aversion. We can tell that they do. What's a good example of this? He's got a great uh, one here. People who could not be induced to work an hour's overtime for $10 will spend an hour taking back defective goods worth $5. And he says, anthropologists have seen this in all sorts of other cultures. People will say things like, well, it's the principle of the thing. And then he asks a really important question. Why do we care so much about the principle? Well, according to Singer, we care so much about the principle because we feel like somebody screwed us when we did something good to them. We gave them some money. We trusted them with, you know, being a consumer, a customer of them. They gave us a product. The product doesn't work. Now we're mad. We're going to go back and get satisfaction. Well, this would be from this basic primitive biological evolutionary basis, according to, to Singer. Now, it gets yet more interesting and more complicated, he says, when we think of ourselves as particularly communicative beings. So he, he brings up two things here. He says, personal resentment transforms into moral indignation when it's shared by other members of a group and brought under a general principle. Because we can imagine ourselves in the position of others and we can formulate general rules which deal with these cases, our own personal feelings of resentment may solidify into a group code with socially accepted standards of what constitutes adequate return for a service and what should be done to those who cheat. The other thing he says is because we communicate, we can move from a what he calls bilateral to multilateral relationship. If I help you, but you don't help me, not only can I 
you know, count on others like looking at that and being like, that guy's a jerk. They're going to say that guy's a jerk. And then even people out of the immediate situation are going to be like, oh, there's that guy who's a jerk. I'm not helping that jerk. And it, it can go on and on for, for, you know, for a long time. As a matter of fact, it could be targeted to people belonging to an entire family group for, for generations. So he says, if, if I help you, but you don't help me, I can cease to help you in the future. If I can talk, I can do more. I can tell everyone in the group what sort of a person you are. Then they will be less likely to help you in the future. But I can also do the reverse. We can ask, is someone a reliable reciprocator? We can, you know, check their reputation. We can see how they've done with other people. And this is what we, in fact, do when we get references or when we're relying on reviews, is it not? We're, we're seeing whether other people fulfilled their agreements. So he's got this great example here. He says, if I've once saved a person from drowning and I'm in need of rescue myself, I will be lucky indeed if the very person I rescued is within earshot. But if the heroic deed is known only to that person I saved, it's unlikely to have any future benefits. On the other hand, if everybody else in the community knows that I jumped into a raging river to save the child, well, then I get a reputation and then they're going to say, we want to help this guy out. And so reciprocal altruism is, you could say, magnified by our communicational and cognitive nexus that develops over time. Singer thinks that reciprocal altruism is indeed a strong norm that runs through practically every culture. He doesn't think that everybody is reciprocally altruistic because there are some who try to cheat and then they get punished as a result. Not necessarily with perfect consistency, but with enough regularity to maintain these norms.